This is Water and Wastewater Treatment Engineering, Module 2, Water Treatment Engineering. This is Part 2 of the Module 2 Lectures. On the topic for today is coagulation, mixing, and flocculation. Our learning objectives for this part of the lecture are to describe the properties and stability of particles in water and the role of coagulation, mixing, and flocculation in water treatment, to apply coagulation theory to a design problem, to calculate the power of mixing input for blending operations and flocculation reactors using the Kampstein RMS velocity gradient, to calculate the coefficient of variation as a metric to characterize the state of mixing in a reactor, and to design a flocculation reactor using the 10 state standards. So typical water treatment facilities that are um, treating surface water will consist of the following processes. Rapid mix after the addition of coagulant and some auxiliary chemicals, followed by flocculation, which involves slower mixing. After the formation of flocks, we have settling and or filtration to remove those flocks. And finally, after that, we would have chlorination and fluoridation uh, before the water is sent to storage and into the distribution system. Um, now with some river supplies, so this would be the case for a relatively clean surface water source like a lake or a reservoir. For some river supplies that have higher turbidity, there might be a few extra steps in the treatment process like pre-sedimentation basin to remove some of the larger materials. And then after that would go into rapid mix with coagulation, flocculation, sedimentation, uh, and in some cases would have two steps of coagulation flocculation in series, followed by sedimentation and filtration before the addition of chlorine and fluoride. So why do we need coagulation? Surface waters in particular contain particulate contaminants. These might include inorganic particulates like clays, silts, and mineral oxides. These are naturally present in surface waters. They enter the water via erosion as precipitation runs off the land or through um, the subsurface. And we also might have some organic particulates. This might include microbial life like viruses, bacteria, algae, protozoa, um, also decaying material from plants and plant litter and animals that have died and decayed in the water source. These could arise from both natural sources, but also from anthropogenic or human, um, human derived sources. So uh, an example of organic particulates that could enter surface water include treated wastewater from an upstream city that's discharging into the water body. The removal of these particulates is required, of course, before uh, we can distribute the water for drinking because um, these particulates can contain uh, pollutants, they cause turbidity, they can impart certain colors or tastes that are found to be objectionable. Um, they could also harbor microbial agents that are infectious, so they might in inhibit the disinfection process and therefore we need to remove the particulates first. Um, Sometimes these particulates could also have toxic substances absorbed to their external surfaces. We also can achieve some degree of removal of natural organic matter um, in the coagulation flocculation processes. So there are kind of two different measures of the effectiveness of coagulation and flocculation processes. The one is reduction in turbidity. So we want to reduce the turbidity in the water source. But the second one is reduction in the concentration of uh, natural organic matter. And uh, these two objectives might require different doses of coagulation so that the appropriate dose to use for the coagulation process would be determined using a laboratory test called a jar test. Um, and the most common method for removing particulate matter and natural organic matter from surface waters is the coagulation flocculation process, usually followed by sedimentation, filtration, or both. Uh, 
So let's talk about what particles we have in water. So the general size of particles in water sources might range from 0 0.001 microns to 100 microns or greater. And um, suspended particles we would generally define as those that are greater than one micron, while colloidal particles in the water source might range from 0 0.001 to one micron, much smaller, and on their own will never really settle uh, without the use of treatment process like chemical coagulation. Uh, natural organic matter in particular is comprised of colloidal organic particles that have sizes that are generally less than 0 0.45 microns. Um, the number of particles in a water source can range from 100 to more than 10,000 particles per milliliter. And it really depends on the quality of the water source. So in some turbid rivers like you might find in, in Florida or southeastern U.S., uh, which serve as sources for drinking water treatment plants, you might find more than 10,000 particles per milliliter. Whereas in more pristine sources, um, like alpine lakes and uh, surface waters used in California, uh, they tend to have much lower count of particles per milliliter. The shape of these particles can be spherical, semi-spherical, ellipsoid, rod-shaped, disc-like, um, almost any different shape you can imagine. And uh, especially the biological particles like bacteria can have different shapes. There are two types of particles in natural water. We can define them as being hydrophobic particles, which are repelling water, or hydrophilic particles, which are attracting water. And um, the particles will also have electrical properties. One of the ways to assess the electrical property of a particle is the isoelectric point. So the isoelectric point is defined as the pH level where the surface charge of that particle is generally neutral. So at pH levels above the isoelectric point, the charge of that particle is generally going to be negative. Whereas at pH levels below the isoelectric point, the charge of the particle will generally be positive. So as you can see in this example below, uh, we've got two different types of particles, alumina and silica. And alumina, you can see, has an isoelectric point of about nine, pH nine. So at that pH, the alumina particle is neutral in charge. However, at pH levels lower than that, like if we had a neutral pH water source like pH seven, the alumina particle is going to have a positive charge. Silica, on the other hand, has a lower isoelectric point, closer to around two. So at pH of seven, like a neutral pH water source, that silica particle is going to have a negative surface charge. And in general, most particles in surface waters tend to have isoelectric points that are below neutral pH levels. So in most water sources, which tend to have pH between six and eight, the surface charge of these particles in waters will generally be negative. There are some exceptions, however. Um, so if a particle has a negative surface charge, it can form what we call the electrical double layer. So suppose we have a particle, like a colloidal particle here, it's negatively charged at the surface, it's going to attract ions in the solution that are positively charged, right? They're going to be attracted to the surface to maintain electroneutrality. Most particles, like I said, in natural waters, uh, clays, humic acids, bacteria, they tend to have negative charges at the pH levels that are most commonly found for drinking water sources, like pH 6 to 8. Uh, so you get this negative surface charge, you get the positive ions closely around the surface of the particle. Those positive ions then attract a double layer, a second layer of negatively charged, mostly negatively charged ions. This is what we call the electrical double layer. And so this double layer sort of acts like a shield to prevent particles with this, these types of surface part properties, prevent them from colliding with each other because they have this electrical double layer which is charged that's kind of uh, preventing their collision from happening. If they don't collide with each other, then they will not react with each other, they won't coagulate with each other, and they'll remain suspended in solution indefinitely. And this is the case with many colloidal particles, natural organic matter particles. Uh, 
So in order to remove these particles from water sources, and again, these particles are too small to be removed by conventional filtration techniques. So in order to remove them, we first need to um, use the process of coagulation to compress that electrical double layer and allow them to collide with each other so that they can form flocks, which are larger solid particles suspended that we can then remove using processes like sedimentation and filtration. So coagulation, therefore, is the process used to destabilize particles in water so that they may be removed by subsequent separation processes, such as sedimentation or filtration. To achieve coagulation, we use chemical coagulants, which are typically inorganic metal compounds. Some examples are alum, ferric chloride, ferric sulfate, um, as well as some other metal salts or synthetic organic coagulants. Uh, we all, may also add some coagulant aids, which are insoluble particulate materials and chemicals that can enhance the coagulation process. Some of these include activated silica, sodium silicate, and bentonite clay. Um, for each of these chemical coagulants, we have uh, stoichiometry that defines how they react with um, constituents in the water and precipitate out a solid material. So here's the stoichiometry for alum. You can see the alum molecule plus if it reacts with um, bicarbonate, for example, in the water source, it will produce a precipitate, aluminum hydroxide, plus sulfate ions, water, and CO2. Now, if that alkalinity in the form of bicarbonate is com completely consumed, then this reaction will produce H plus ions, which will affect the pH, lowering the pH of the water source. Um, however, we can counteract that pH change by adding caustic soda or sodium hydroxide to the coagulation uh, reaction as well to precipitate out again the aluminum hydroxide without causing this decrease in pH. Here are two other examples for ferric chloride and ferric sulfate. So again, precipitating out ferric hydroxide in both cases, uh, which will be removed by sedimentation or filtration. So there are a few different mechanisms of coagulation that may occur. The first is adsorption and charge neutralization. So when the right amount of coagulant is used, the ionic strength of the solution increases and that contributes to the compression of the electrical double layer. This makes the repulsion, repulsive force of the particles more easy, easy to overcome by van der Waals forces, which can help form those flocks that will result in larger flocculation particles that can be removed later on. Um, however, if this ideal amount of coagulant is exceeded, if too much coagulant, too much polymer is added, the particles will actually obtain a positive charge and the, they will become stable once again. So they'll form an electrical double layer where the surface charge is positive and they attract negative ions uh, around the surface, which attracts the double layer of positive ions, um, kind of defeating the purpose to begin with. So uh, you need to therefore optimize the correct amount of coagulant to get adsorption and charge neutralization. The second mechanism that can result in uh, coagulation flocculation is called enmeshment, which is also called sweep flocculation. So when we have high enough doses of coagulants, the aluminum and iron will form insoluble precipitates and particulate matter will become entrapped in those precipitates. As you saw in the previous stoichiometry, ferric hydroxide, um, aluminum hydroxide, this is known as sweep flocculation. The third mechanism is adsorption and interparticle bridging. So this is for non-ionic polymers that have high molecular weights and low surface charges. Some of the chains on those polymers can absorb onto particulate surfaces at one or more sites. And um, the remaining part of the polymer can remain extended into the solution and absorb onto available surface sites for other particulates. This creates kind of like a bridge where you're connecting one group of particulates with another using these long um, polymer molecules. And so you can see these three mechanisms shown here in the graphics.
A jar test, as I mentioned, is used to identify the ideal concentration or the ideal dose of coagulant that needs to be added for a given water source. So depending on the water source, this dose can change. Um, and it can even change throughout the year if the water, the quality of the surface water changes throughout the year. So jar tests are, are performed at water quality laboratories at water treatment plants uh, quite frequently. And they're used to optimize and to check the optimal coagulant doses. Um, the jar test simulates expected conditions in the coagulation flocculation process. And it's done in, using a small reactor or beakers like you can see in the photo here uh, with some stirring bars. And so we kind of have four typical scenarios that we can encounter depending on the colloid concentration. So let's start with scenario S1. If we have a very low concentration of colloids in our water source, then we're going to get um, the electrical double layer creating that negative charge until we reach a high enough dose to achieve sweep flocculation. All right, as you can see with region number four here. So for very low concentration of, of colloids, it's really just finding that ideal coagulant dose to get that sweep flocculation effect. If we have a slightly higher concentration of colloids in our water source, then of course at low coagulant dose, doses, we're still in that realm where we have the electrical double layer, the, the negative charge pre preventing those flocks from forming. If we hit the sweet spot, we might get a dip in the turbidity concentration due to number two, which is adsorption and charge neutralization. So we might be able to get a small reduction in turbidity. However, if we increase the coagulant dose beyond that ideal point, it'll go back up to high turbidity where we are in zone three, which is where the particles will stabilize from having a positively charged surface, which creates that electrical double layer. Um, if we move up high enough, eventually, again, we will reach zone four, which is sweep flocculation. In scenario three, S3, we have slightly higher co colloid concentrations. We'll get a more pronounced effect of that charge neutralization and subsequent absorption. So we'll see that there will be a sweet point with this coagulant dose that we might be able to optimize to achieve flocculation without adding too much coagulant. Uh, in scenario S4, we, we really just have um, Situation one, the electrical double layer, moving into uh, situation two, the absorption and charge neutralization. All right, enhanced coagulation is what's used to describe the situation when we have natural organic matter as our objective for um, the coagulation flocculation process. So as I mentioned before, Coagulation flocculation can achieve reductions in turbidity, which is of course important, uh, but it can also achieve reductions in the concentration of natural organic constituents, which in some cases might be the preferred objective for, for water treatment. So the ideal doses of coagulants is different for these two different objectives. Um, so if we see here in the graph, dissolved organic carbon is a surrogate measurement for uh, natural organic matter. And we have turbidity here on the left axis. So the alum dose based on turbidity might be around 30 milligrams per liter. But if our goal is to achieve reduction of DOC, dissolved organic carbon, we might need a higher dose of like 40 milligrams per liter uh, for this particular example. So the solution conditions, like the pH of the water, the hardness of the water, the temperature of the water source, those are all going to affect the dosage and the effectiveness of the coagulants. Generally, higher coagulant dosages are needed at higher pH values um, and at higher temperatures as well. So let's do an example problem. Using the stoichiometry of alum precipitation, let's show that one gram of alum produces approximately 0 0.26 grams of insoluble aluminum hydroxide precipitate and approximately 0.44 grams of carbon dioxide. And then we will determine how much, alkaline, how, how much alkalinity is consumed in this reaction. 
All right, so for this problem, the first thing we want to do is determine the amount of insoluble aluminum hydroxide that's produced from one gram of alum. So we'll start with our one gram of aluminum sulfate. And then we'll multiply that by the molecular weight. It's 594 grams per mole. Then we will use the molar, re molar relationship between alum and aluminum hydroxide. So that's a ratio of two to one, two moles of aluminum hydroxide for every mole of alum. And then we'll convert that back to a mass of aluminum hydroxide using the molecular weight, which is 78 grams per mole. And that is equal to 0 0.26 grams. All right, so the next step is then use the stoichiometry to determine the amount of carbon dioxide produced. So here, we're going to use the same exact procedure. Start with one gram of alum. Convert that to a moles using the molecular weight. Then the molar relationship between CO2 and alum, according to the stoichiometry, is 6 to 1. And the molecular weight of CO2 is 44 grams per mole. That gives us a value of 0 0.44 grams of CO2. Lastly, the same approach can be used to determine how much alkalinity is consumed. So here we've got the molar relationship between bicarbonate and alum which is also six to one. So we're gonna start with, again, one gram of alum. And that molar relationship is six. Six to one. Now, in order to express the alkalinity as grams equiv of equivalent grams of, of calcium carbonate, we need to use the equivalency. Uh, so one equivalency of alkalinity is, is the same as one mole of bicarbonate. Finally, we're going to multiply that whole thing by the mass of calcium carbonate per equivalent, which is 50 grams per equivalent.
and that gives us a value of 0 0.5 grams as calcium carbonate. That's how much alkalinity will be consumed as a result of the coagulation. This is how much CO2 will be produced. This is how much precipitate will be produced. All right, the next step after addition of coagulants in the treatment process, the next step is rapid mixing, which is also called blending. So rapid mixing provides the rapid disport, dispersion of these chemicals, typically within a time frame of 10 to 30 seconds. That's usually the goal. So if we have an inlet to a rapid mixer, we might have um, vertical, you know, the flow might go vertically through these uh, vertical impellers, which are spinning around and mixing this water source rapidly. Uh, we could include some baffles here to encourage, again, more turbulent flow and mixing, better mixing conditions. The chemical feed would be added at some point in the tank and then it would go towards the outlet where at that point, ideally, the concentration of the coagulant or the, and the auxiliary chemicals would be uniform throughout the water source. So the most common method is using uh, mechanical mixers with a vertical shaft impeller and baffles like you can see here. Although we have some other methods include suspended propellers, static mixing elements, which can be inserted into a pipe, and even just hydraulic mixing, like injecting chemicals in the inlet of a centrifugal pump if pumping is required as well. Uh, so here you can see um, flash mixing for a pumped uh, water source. You've got the, the chemical being dosed in through this pipe here that you can see into the larger uh, pipe, which is transporting the water, which is to be mixed with the chemical. You've got a diffuser plate here added to get the chemical to spread around as it passes through this pipe. And at the end here, you get some mixing water, mixing of the water and the chemical. So the, this, this, um, this inlet would be designed with a certain distance here to ensure the mixing conditions are achieved by the end of the pipe. We also have different types of inline static mixers where the chemical might be dosed in right before this device and um, using these kind of like baffles which have uh, require the water to go up or down or over and cause the creation of eddies and turbulent flow, you'll get mixing as well within the pipe. So this is another way that uh, coagulants can be mis mixed into a water source. Then we've got the inline venturi mixer which is um, where you've got the pipe connected to this fitting here where uh, you have a narrow throat section that draws in the chemical and the diverging section afterwards, which causes turbulent flow, allowing for pressure recovery and mixing of the chemical coagulant with the water source. We can monitor the efficacy of mixing processes by um, doing a tracer test. So uh, as you recall in our first module, we talked about tracer test being where you inject a chemical tracer, which is conservative, meaning that it's not going to disappear, react, or uh, volatilize, or anything. It's gonna stay that whatever you add in is going to be remaining in the outlet of the mixer or the blending process. So um, the tracer concentration then would be measured at the effluent of the blending process. And you'll have, of course, a fluctuation of the effluent tracer concentration, which reflects non-ideal mixing conditions. The higher these peaks and the lower these valleys would indicate um, poor mixing. And the more tempered these peaks and valleys, the more stable this concentration is at the effluent would indicate better mixing conditions. So the peakiness of these valleys and, and slopes can be measured by uh, sigma sub m, which is the standard deviation of the concentration there. All right, and so let's do an activity. I want you to write an equation for the volume fraction of chemical that's added to a stream. And we're gonna call that x bar sub a. So, Again, this is the fraction of the chemical. If you can imagine the chemical being dosed in through the small tube and the water is passing through the large tube, it's the fraction volumetrically, it's the fraction of the chemical that's added to that water stream. So first I want you to express this in terms of a ratio of flow rates. 
So we can use the following notation. Q sub A is the flow rate of the feed stream for the chemical. So it's how fast we're pumping this chemical through this tube, through this pipe, sorry. Uh, and you can express that in cubic meters per second, for example. And Q sub W would be the flow rate of the water stream being treated. And again, we can use the units of cubic meters per second. So just express this using the variables QA, QW, and X bar sub A. Then after you do that, try to express this fraction in terms of a ratio of concentrations, where concentration C sub dose is the dose of the chemical that's being applied to the water stream. So meaning after this chemical mixes in with the water stream, what is the concentration that we wish to achieve in the water stream? And C sub A would be the concentration of the chemical in the feed stream. So we might be dosing in a chemical solution, which is not um, pure alum, but it has some concentration of alum, which is highly concentrated in the chemical stream. Um, by diffusing it and mixing it into the water, we're achieving this more dilute concentration, C sub dose, which is the desired dose. Um, and that would be the dose, again, determined using a jar test. So this activity, take a few minutes, um, express this volume fraction in terms of the ratio of flow rates and then in terms of the ratio of concentrations. All right, so we've got a water pipe here delivering the water that's to be treated. All right, and this has a flow rate of Q sub W. And to that water stream, we have an inset here, a pipe that is delivering a flow rate, Q sub A, of the coagulant. And that coagulant is being delivered at a concentration C sub A. As this mixes in with the larger flow rate of the water, what we have here coming out at the end, right, because we have this coagulant being dosed at a volume of Q sub A. So what's leaving the reactor is then a flow rate that's equivalent to Q sub A plus Q sub W. And the concentration in that effluent stream needs to be equal to our target concentration, C sub dose. So therefore, the question is, how do we write an equation that indicates the volumetric fraction of the chemical being added to the stream? And we're gonna call that X bar sub A. So if we're looking at expressing it in terms of the flow rates, we have the flow rate coming in, Q sub A, divided by the total flow rate, which is Q sub A plus Q sub W. We can also express it in terms of the concentrations. So just like we divide Q sub A by Q sub A plus Q sub W, if we look at the concentrations here, we can equally divide Q, uh, C sub A by C of dose. So this can be equivalent to the concentration of our coagulant stock divided by the concentration that we're seeking in this effluent after mixing is complete. All right, and here's the solution uh, again to that problem where we can see that X bar sub A is equal to QA, which is the feed stream flow rate, divided by the sum of QA plus QW. And if we express that in terms of concentrations, it's the ratio of the concentration that we are, achieve, that we are wishing to achieve in terms of the dose and divided by the concentration of the chemical in the feed stream. So again, we can use this standard deviation. And if we normalize the standard deviation by the average concentration in the effluent, we can calculate what's called the coefficient of variation of mixing. And this 
can be used as a test to determine if mixing has been sufficiently achieved. So usually targets for the coefficient of variation in a blending process might be specified as something like less than 5%. All right, so here's the equations that can be used to calculate the coefficient of mixing. In practice, there's several applications where we might use mixing in water treatment plants. And depending on the reaction that's taking place, um, the speed of the mixing may or may not be as important. So for example, uh, let's say we're designing a coagulation process using ferric or alum. This is a reaction that happens very fast. So in other words, the chemical reaction happens almost faster than the mixing process. Therefore, the time of the mixing is the controlling factor for the reaction rate. Uh, in this case, we would want to really optimize our blending process to minimize the size of our reactor because the reactor size is more dependent on the mixing efficiency and less so dependent on how fast or slow the reaction proceeds. Um, another example is pH adjustment. Again, we might need to adjust the pH prior to disinfection or after coagulation flocculation. Uh, this again, if we are, if we're using something like sulfuric acid to adjust the pH, this is a very fast reaction. Again, the time of mixing is what really controls the reaction rate. Um, and it's important in a lot of these cases that the mixing should be complete before the next treatment process is introduced. So if we are adjusting the pH to an ideal level to achieve uh, chlorination, efficient chlorination, of course, we want to make sure that that pH adjustment is achieved and thoroughly mixed into the solution before we send it on to the, the chlorination tank. Because if the pH is not totally adjusted throughout, we have uneven mixing, we're going to have uneven application of the chlorine, and that's going to result in a lower efficiency of disinfection. So uh, in these two situations here, the time of mixing is really uh, important to optimize. So two other situations here, the first one being the chlorination of natural organic matter and the, the resulting formation of disinfection byproducts. This is a reaction that uh, takes place very slowly. So it could be 10 to 20 hours or even more. And in this situation, the time of mixing is irrelevant for the reaction rate. So um, regardless of how efficient our mixing processes are, we will still see the same level of production of disinfection byproducts. Uh, another example here, the reaction of chlorine with ammonia to form chloramines. This is a fast reaction initially if the chlorine to nitrogen ratio is low. However, the higher that ratio gets, the slower the reaction takes place. So the time of mixing becomes relevant only if the chlorine to nitrogen ratio is low. Uh, so after mixing, again, comes the flocculation process. So we're in the rapid mixing in the blending tank. We have really, we're trying to achieve the most rapid mixing, the most rapid blending possible. In the flocculation chamber, we are also mixing the water using, uh, for example, paddle wheel mixers, uh, but the mixing is much slower. The purpose of the mixing here is to move around the particles so that they can come into contact with each other after the coagulation has neutralized their electrical repulsion or resulted in that kind of sweep flock effect. Um, however, we don't wanna mix it so fast that it breaks apart the flock particles that have formed. So it's kind of a balancing of slow mixing, uh, but not too slow. And some different ways that we can achieve this, you can see in this first situation, we've got the influent from coagulation, which is going into three chambers of a flocculation basin. And in each chamber, we've got a pitch blade turbine, vertical turbine mixing um, you know, in a clockwise direction. And these baffles right here have diffuser panels, which you know, really just allow the even flow of the water from one chamber to another. And we have three chambers followed by uh, entrance into the sedimentation basin. An alternative design to that is, again, where we have the three chambers, but instead of these vertical Turbine mixers, we've got these horizontal paddle wheel mixers, which just move around slowly, 
in uh, alternating directions in each of the chambers to, to provide that gentle, slow mixing for flocculation. Uh, another way to achieve this is by uh, using baffles. So having, just having the water go around these horizontal baffles. And in some cases, we might also add vertical baffles. Uh, this is a way to achieve it without the um, mechanical mixers, which require a drive motor and energy source. There are design guidelines for flocculation processes. So these general guidelines come from the 10 state standards, which are you know, used in, exclusively used in 10 states of the United States, but are generally referred to as, as universal standards for the design of water treatment processes. Uh, so in the 10 state standards, we have inlet and outlet design that needs to prevent short circuiting and turbulence, uh, the minimum flow through velocity be uh, between 0 0.5 5 and 1.5 feet per minute. Um, the detention time should be at least 30 minutes. And the agitators should be driven by variable speed drives with the peripheral speed of the paddles being between 0 0.5 to 3 feet per second. All right, so um, we, well, we, what do we mean by saying we want to minimize, prevent short circuiting and turbulence? Uh, short circuiting happens if we have a reactor with, which has an inlet and an outlet, for example. The inlet is at one point in this situation. The water is not going to completely mix throughout the entire re reactor. It's going to kind of follow a short circuit, like a short shortcut path to the outlet. And depending on the conditions of the reactor, you might also see some recirculating flow paths, um, which kind of, uh, again, follow this short circuiting path where you have a higher velocity. In the corners here, you, you would tend to see very low velocity conditions where the water is very stagnant. And in this case, you're really not using the entire volume of the reactor. So your reactor could be much smaller uh, if you would just make the hydraulics more efficient. All right, so you can see here the short circuiting effect. Flocculation design guidelines from 10 state standards are that uh, ideally flocculation sedimentation basins shall be closely, closely placed together in the treatment plant. In, if possible, they should be adjacent to each other, maybe just separated by um, a diffuser panel. The velocity of the flocculated water through the conduits to sedimentation should not be less than 0 0.5, and it should not be greater than 1.5 feet per second. And we want to eliminate unnecessary bends or changes in the direction to minimize turbulence. All right, the, the way that we, another way that we design mixing chambers and flocculation basins is using what's called the root mean square velocity gradient, which is also referred to as the energy input rate. We use the variable G bar to to define this input rate. So this was originally proposed by Camp and Steen, 1943. Uh, it's used generally now as a design parameter for mixing in all types of reactors, including rapid, rapid mixing chambers, but also in flocculation basins. So the equation for G bar is as follows. G bar is equal to the square root of P divided by mu times V, where P is the power of the mixing input in joules per second or in watts and mu is the absolute dynamic viscosity of water, which has the units newton seconds per meter squared. V in this case would be the volume of the reactor, for example, in cubic meters. And um, these units, in using SI units, these would cancel out to provide the units for G of one divided by seconds, or seconds to the negative one. All right, so that's the energy input rate. The power of the mixing input, of course, would determine uh, what type of energy source we might need to power, to power our paddle mixers or our turbine mixer. The viscosity of water is going to vary for different temperatures. And uh, I've posted on Canvas a uh, link to a document that shows the viscosity of water at different temperature conditions. All right, so this is the approach that we are going to use to determine the volume of these reactors. Let's do an example problem. Say we have a rapid mixing tank that measures one meter by one meter by 1.2 meters. 
the power input is one horsepower or 746 watts. We want to find the G value for water at a temperature of 15 degrees Celsius. And we can assume here that the absolute dynamic viscosity of water at that temperature is equal to 0 0.00113 Newton seconds per square meter. For this problem, we're going to use our Kamp-Stein velocity gradient equation, which is that G bar is equal to the square root of P over mu times V, where mu is the dynamic viscosity, V is the volume of the reactor, and P is the power input. So we're already provided with the following information, that P is equivalent to 746 watts, and that's the same thing as 746 joules per second. Mu, the dynamic viscosity at 15 degrees Celsius is equal to 0 0.00113. The units there are Newton seconds per meter squared. And finally, the volume is the last input variable, which we know is equivalent to 1.2 cubic meters. So this is just a straight application of the equation here. 746 joules per second divided by 0 0.00113 newtons. Uh, remember, has the equivalent units of joules per meter, so the units here can also be expressed as joule seconds per meter cubed, and that's multiplied by our volume of 1.2 cubic meters. So the joules cancel out, seconds. to the top and this becomes um, seconds squared. We get meters cubed are canceling out. And if we calculate this value, we should get 741.7 the units there are seconds to the negative one all right let's do another example let's say we have vertical turbines that are used to that are to be used for flocculation in a water treatment plant with a design capacity of 60 million gallons per day flocculation is to be designed appropriately for a maximum daily peaking factor of 2.7 with three parallel treatment trains, and each train is going to have two compartments in series. The total detention time for the flocculation basin should be 30 minutes. So if the plant has three rapid mix tanks in parallel with a detention time of 20 seconds for each of them, then determine the volume of each rapid mix tank. Then part B, determine the dimensions of each compartment in the flocculation basin. In part C, determine the power that must be input to the water for each compartment to achieve a, a G value of 80 seconds to the negative one. All right, so in this situation, we've got a treatment plant that uses three uh, parallel trains of coagulant mixing and then flocculation, as you can see here. And we've got an average daily flow rate of 60 million gallons per day with a peak flow rate of 162 million gallons per day coming into the system. So what we're told is that the blending tank should have a retention time of 20 seconds and the flocculation reactors should have a retention time of 30 minutes. Uh, so part A is what is the volume of each of the mixing tanks, the required volume? So we're gonna wanna do this calculation with the peak flow rate. So if the flow rate in each train is equal to 162 divided by three. This is equivalent to 54 million gallons per day, which is the same thing as 625 gallons per second. 
So that's our flow rate coming into each of the blending reactors. And um, given that we're told we need a retention time of 20 seconds to find the volume of each reactor, we take that flow rate, 625 gallons per second, multiplied by 20 seconds, and that gives us a volume of 12,500 gallons. So next we're going to want to check to see how this is going to work out during average flow conditions. So our average flow rate is 60 million gallons per day divided by 3, which is equivalent to 20 million gallons per day. However, since our peaking factor is almost 3, and we've got three train, trains in parallel, we can anticipate that if we were to take two of the blending tanks offline, this now becomes a flow rate of 60 million gallons per day, which is very similar to our flow rate here of 54 million gallons per day. So in gallons per second, this would be equal to 694 gallons per second. Now the volume would be still equivalent to 12,500 gallons per reactor. Uh, so therefore, if we only have one of those reactors online, we would take that volume. So let's find the retention time. which is equal to volume divided by flow rate. So the volume of one of those reactors being online, 12,500 gallons, divided by the flow rate, 694 gallons per second. And that's going to equal 18 seconds. So therefore, under average flow conditions, we would be able to take two of those blending tanks offline and still have a mixing time of 18 seconds. Therefore, we probably want to have some interconnection here where everything comes to a mixing point, a central mixing point, and then gets redistributed out in case we wanted to take two of these offline or one of them offline, depending on the flow rate, and then redistribute into one, two, or three of the flocculation basins. All right. All right, the second part of this problem is to determine the dimensions of each compartment in the flocculation reactors. So these reactors, we're told, have uh, two compartments in series, and therefore the volume in the entire reactor is twice the volume of each compartment. We can assume for the purpose of this example problem that the, that the compartments are cube in dimension, so that the length, the width, and the height are all the same. So let's start again with the peak flow conditions. So under peak flow conditions, if we want to have a retention time of 30 minutes, which is the equivalent of 900 seconds, 
and the way we so this is 900 seconds per compartment therefore if we multiply this 900 seconds by the flow rate at peak flow conditions, which we determined in the first part is 625 gallons per second. That's going to give us a volume of 562,500 gallons. Keep in mind this is per compartment. So that volume is equivalent to 75,196 cubic feet. Therefore, the dimensions of one of these compartments, if we're assuming that it's cube in shape, is equal to the cube root of 75,196, which is equivalent to 42.2 .2 feet. So, if we're operating under peak flow conditions, We can have two compartments, and the dimensions of this chamber would be 42.2. The entire length here would be 84.4 feet, and the width here would be 42.2 feet. So two, two compartments, both cubes. 42.2 by 42.2 by 42.2. So let's check and see how that works out under average flow conditions. It's the same situation as we had in the first part of the problem. Um, since our peaking factor is approximately equal to three, even if we were to take two of the flocculation basins offline during average flow conditions, we would still have approximately the same flow rate per, per parallel line. So we calculated in the first part that this flow rate would be equal to 694 gallons per second. This is when only one reactor is online. All right, so if we take the volume of just one of these compartments, which we calculated in, in the previous part is 562,500 gallons. We multiply that by two because we have two compartments. And then we divide that whole thing by this flow rate, 694 gallons per second. This is going to give us a value of 1,620 seconds, which is equivalent to 
27 minutes. So therefore, we can also take off two of these flocculation basins if we're just operating at the average flow rate of 60 million gallons per day, we can take off two of those basins offline and still achieve a retention time of approximately 27 minutes. Finally, part three, Part three is to determine the power input requirements for each of these compartments to achieve a G value of 80 seconds to the negative one. All right, so here, what we need to do is utilize our Kamstein velocity gradient equation, which again is that G bar is equal to the square root of P over mu V. And we want to rearrange this equation to solve for the power input requirements for a given G value. So G bar squared times mu V is equal to P. We need to assume a value for dynamic viscosity. We weren't specifically told. Let's just assume a value at 15 degrees Celsius, like we did in the last example problem. So that means that the viscosity is equal to 0.00113 newton seconds per cubic meter, sorry, per square meter. We know that the G value is equal to 80 seconds to the negative one, and our volume from the previous part, we know that the volume is 562,500 gallons, uh, but remember here we're working with meters and units meter here, so we need to convert that to a cubic meter. So that is equal to 562,500 gallons is equivalent to 2,129 cubic meters. All right, so now our power requirements equal to 80 seconds to the negative one squared times 0 0.00113 newton seconds divided by meter squared multiplied by 2129 meters cubed. And that gives us approximately 15,400 joules per second. So that would be the power requirements per compartment for whatever mixers that we use here, whether it's paddle wheel mixers or turbine mixers in each of these compartments for flocculation. This would be our total power requirement.